It's a great privilege being given the opportunity to remix these albums in 5.1. In their early career, the Floyd were one of the first bands to actually use a surround sound PA system for their live performances. So it's a natural progression that they would want their recorded work to be heard in this format. The major issue with the packaging, I think, for the SACD was how to represent the old and the new. The SACD was new, so we wanted a slightly different image, but the old package from 1975 was um, much admired by the band, I think, and by myself. So I had a bit of a problem. How, how can I be new but old? And the solution to this problem, as I saw it, was to submit the, as it were, original design to the element in which it was represented way back in 75. So I burnt a picture of the burning man. I drowned a picture of the diving man. And I put the picture of the man in the desert back in the desert. Whereas the veil, which is about air or wind, was a picture of the veil as per the original, but thrown in the air and re-photographed flying through the air. So these images are now slightly different, and they look different, but they resonate with the old. When mixing Shine On You Crazy Diamond parts one through five, I noticed that there was a missing piano part. After the second guitar solo, there's a verse section where Rick plays a, a horn solo on a mini mode. And on the original stereo mix of the album, there is a piano, an acoustic piano part, behind that solo blocking the chord changes. Well, it was nowhere to be found on the, on the multi-track. We hunted everywhere, went through all the outtakes, phoned Ian at Abbey Road to say, are you absolutely sure you've sent us all the correct tapes? And he assured us he had. So I phoned the band and asked them if they had any memory of what had gone on and why that piano may be missing. And unfortunately, their memories, none of their memories stretch back that far, or to that event, I should say. So I began to speculate about what may have happened. And I imagined a scenario where they were at Abbey Road doing a playback of the mix, having completed it. And having got to the end, somebody may have said, I think we should have had a piano in that verse behind the mini Moog solo. And somebody else may have said, well, we're certainly not going to remix it. In those days, all mixing was manual. There was no such thing as doing a quick recall of the mix. And if they felt that they had really captured uh, the right feel, which clearly they had, uh, re remixing was, was not really a viable option. So a logical solution would have been to play the quarter-inch mix back through the console, feed it to a pair of headphones, and effectively have Rick play a live piano overdub to the master mix while printing it to a second quarter-inch machine. Uh, having done that, it was just a simple process of then just editing that section into the original master. But it does mean that that piano part would only exist on that master tape. It would not be on the multi-track. You could never go back and readjust it at any point in the future. So I thought, well, if that's what had happened, the evidence of that would be there would be an edit on the master tape, there would be an edit going into that section and an edit coming out of it. And sure enough, there was. And I also thought, well, I, w I went back and listened to Brian Humphrey's um, quad mix, original quad mix, and I thought, if this is the case, again, that piano would not be on his quad mix, it would be missing from his quad mix, and sure enough, it was missing. So the, the theory seemed pretty logical. So I went to London to play the 5.1 mix to the band uh, to get their input. And I played it to David and Rick at Astoria. And the following day, played it for Roger and Nick at a studio in London. We went to British Grove, which is Mark Knopfler's studio. And actually, I went there principally because of the speakers that they have. Uh, but it just so happens that in addition to all the other incredible equipment that Mark has, he has a, a really beautiful a uh, Bosendorfer concert grand piano that sounds wonderful. So I phoned Rick and said, why don't you come down to the studio after I've played this for Roger and Nick and we can have a go at overdubbing that piano. So Rick came down that evening and we listened very carefully to the original 
and tried to match as closely as we possibly could exactly what he had played more than 30 years earlier. Um, recorded the piano at British Grove, brought it back here, put it into the mix, and, uh, and now we have the piano restored, played again by Rick more than 30 years later. When we came to do Darkside, uh, Rick was largely responsible because he said, I don't want one of your crummy pictures, Storm. Why can't we have some cool graphic? And I said, well, Rick, I don't do cool graphics. I do crummy pictures, as you call them. And so he said, well, I'll do it anyway. And I said, but I can't, I don't do that. It's not my thing. He said, well, take it as a challenge. Endeavor to rise to the challenge, to rise to the occasion, Storm. He was very condescending and quite funny about it. And I walked away and I was so annoyed that I took up the challenge and did a, what we sometimes call a cool graphic, which was Dark Side, of which Rick was, of course, eternally grateful because it wasn't one of my crummy pictures. However, when we came to wish you were here, I think I felt it was time to return to the crummy pictures, as Rick called it. Thank you.